In this video, we're going to look at one of the very important components of JPA, and that is the JPA entity class. This is a class that represents a relational database table with each object of that class corresponding to a single row in the table that is being modeled. We write this class in our application and for it to be a proper JPA entity class, there are some requirements that we must meet. We start off by annotating the class as a Java X persistence entity, and we'll see how we can do that in a few moments. The class must have a public or protected no argument constructor. It can have other constructors that we use within our application, but as far as JPA is concerned, it will make use of the no argument constructor and then call a load of get and set methods that we will have to provide. The class, its methods, and any persistent instance variables must not be declared final, and the persistent instance variables must not be declared public. They have to be private and can only be accessed by the entity class's methods. These requirements need to be in place so that the JPA persistence provider is able to create instances of this class and then populate the private persistent instance variables with data from the database or indeed get data from the object to put into the database. Let's take a look at this very basic entity class. I'm using Lombok annotations, so that really makes the class much simpler to read. We will have an all args constructor for our own purposes within the application. Here's the no args constructor for JPA's purposes, getters and setters for all the attributes. I'm also providing an equals and hash code method so that we can do some comparisons, which we'll see in the next video. There's the annotation that makes this class a JPA entity. And there's the full path name of that class that we are using for this annotation. We're also using a table annotation that identifies which table this class relates to. The assumption is that the class name and the copy name will be the same. And if that assumption is true, we don't need this table annotation. But if there is any variation from it, in other words, if this class name is not identical to the table name, then we use the table annotation to identify the name of the corresponding table. By default, these field names map to corresponding columns in the database table that have the same name as these fields. If there is any variation from that assumption, we can put a column annotation in front of the field to identify the database table column name that will map to this entity's field name. The ID annotation allows us to identify which field is going to contain the value of the primary key in the database table. And that's all we need to do for the most basic of entity classes. We identify the class as an entity. We identify the table that it maps. We identify the primary key field. And we make sure that we have fields for each of the columns in the table that we're mapping to. Let's take a look at this example that we saw in the previous video. We have these three database tables, book, copy, and copy status, one-to-many relationships between book and copy, and also copy status and copy. Here are the foreign keys in copy that implement those one-to-many relationships. And in our application, we have these classes. Now, these are going to be the entity classes. I haven't shown the methods here, all the get methods and the constructors and the set methods. But we can see that we have these properties that correspond to these columns and also the collection of copy objects that exist because of that one-to-many relationship. In copy, again, we've got the fields that correspond to the table columns. And notice that this foreign key, which is merely a value that identifies a row over in this table, in our object model becomes a reference to an object of the book class. And similarly, status ID corresponds over here, and that becomes an object reference to one of these objects. Let's take a look at how this can be done in our classes. 
Again, this is a JPA entity. Even though the table names are the same, I decided I'd put the table annotation in there just to explicitly show the table that we're interacting with, with the necessary annotations up here from Lombok that will get rid of all the boilerplate code in here. This is the field for the primary key. We've also got the title, the author, and the ISBN. These are the columns that are in the database table. And what I wanted to focus on particularly was how the one-to-many relationship that book has with copy is implemented in the code. We know that we need a collection of copy objects. To tell JPA how to do that mapping, we need some other annotations, this one particularly, the at one-to-many annotation. And what we do is tell it which field in the copy object is going to be the relational field with this book. In other words, there is going to be a field in the copy object that has a reference back to the book object, and it's that field there. And because I want the collection of copies to be ordered, I'm also using an order by annotation, telling it which value in copy to use for doing the sorting. In the copy entity class, we've got an ID, and in the database table, we've got a book ID, but I'm calling this field book. And what I'm doing with the many-to-one annotation is saying, look, this is the other end of that one-to-many relationship that we were just looking at in the book class. We're identifying the database table column that holds the value that forms that one-to-many relationship. In other words, this is the foreign key in the copy table. And JPA will use that foreign key to go to the book table to obtain the data for that related book, form a book object, and store a reference to it in here. So the copy object now has got a reference back to a book object. And JPA does all of that automatically. Similarly, we have a many to one with copy status. Here is the column name that holds the foreign key value to the copy status table. And JPA will go to the copy status table, obtain the data for that particular copy status, create the object and store a reference to that object in this field here. Now that we've written the entity classes, what do we do? Well, it depends. We might decide that we're going to handcraft our own interaction with the persistence provider, in which case we would obtain a reference to the entity manager and then call its methods passing entity objects to it and receiving entity objects from it. But in Spring Boot, we could do it a different way. We could use a JPA repository that will, in the background, make use of the Entity Manager. And that's what we'll look at in the next video. So in this video, we've talked about JPA entity classes and annotations for those classes. We've only scratched the surface, so I would recommend that you do some background reading about all of those to get more details.